Welcome once again, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure and it's awesome from all the Yehudi rabbis and the organization to see everybody here tonight on this awesome, awesome, fun journey. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna take just a, a take, how long it takes us, half an hour, an hour to walk through the of the Jews leaving Egypt and going through the whole, the whole, the whole Haggadah, the whole, the whole way through. It's going to be awesome with a lot of different rabbis speaking with different questions. It's going to be a lot of fun, but let's try for that this time just to, we can use some meditation, just breathing, just to cut ourselves out from what's going on in the, in the world right now. There's a lot going on and it's a lot of craziness and just try to focus for this time and just enjoy and just feel it. Um, so we'll start off just with, just with, um, um, I guess, why do we focus on the past? Jake, we still ask the question. There was a, there was, with, there was, in, a, in NASA, there was a lot of excitement. They were about to go on a mission that's never been done in history. We're talking about they're about to go to a planet which was hundreds and hundreds of years away. So there's only one way to do it, was to get together a few couples, go on, create this rocket ship which had everything it needed to last for hundreds of years and create a few, get a few volunteers to go on this rocket ship and live a life from year to year, from generation to generation, to finally they reach this planet which they want to go and see. So they start off, they've got the mission, they've got the passion, they've got the excitement, they're ready to go. They will get in and a few years, first few years, 10 years, 20 years, doing great and they have children on there and the children start growing old and the children start marrying their children. And it's going amazing. And the grandchildren are sitting on the grandparents' lap and they're telling them about the grass and the mountains and the awesomeness of the world they had below. It's all about it. They didn't see it, but they're telling them all about it, how amazing it was. And then, you know, as years go on, the grandparents start passing, passing away and the, the children, are, the other grandchildren are growing up and they're getting married now. But now there's nobody on the rocket ship which saw what was, saw the earth. So now everything's okay. You know, the passion's not as much there. The passion, the excitement's not there all the time. So they start, you know, messing around with some controls, you know, trying to try some different flavors, some different actions, some faster, some slower, which is awesome, great. But they, re they realize that things are not going the way it's going. So now they're stuck start getting nervous. So they decide they're going to call a meeting. They get everybody together and they call a meeting and they all sit down and they all start repeating what their grandfather told them when sitting on their laps. What they all started going over about the world they, that is down below and about this mission about going to this awesome planet and what they're going to accomplish. It, suddenly they fell in the room, this excitement and this passion and this, this energy to keep on, keep on, and to do the right thing and go back on the right path and just try to focus on what they're heading for. So, yes, we, none of us were at, were in Egypt, none of us left. We didn't see that awesomeness of God taking us out through splitting the sea, all that greatness, we didn't see it. But our great, great, great grandparents, they did. So when we come every single year, you're gonna turn around, Rabbi, you know, all your, your safety parents, we've done this. Like we heard this story. We've been through this journey. Yes, because what we do every year, we have the craziness of the whole year. But every year we take those few minutes, those few hours and we sit down, we gather around the table and our parents and our grandparents tell us what was, what their parents told them, what their parents told them, what awesomeness there was by leaving Egypt and what awesomeness and what, what at the end of the Seder, at the end of the night, we turn around the Shana Habab Yerushalayim and what we're looking forward to and what's our mission. So tonight, what we're going to do, we're going to just try to focus on that, try to get into that mode and try to feel it and try to get the excitement and try to get the energy and the, just remember that awesomeness and together with the rabbis and together with all the students and whoever's here with us, I think, I think it's going to be awesome. We're going to feel it and we're really going to, you know, do something which we haven't done before. Um, so what we're going to start off with, we're going to start off the, 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 whole, the whole book, the whole Haggadah goes through different stages. So we're going to start off with 
Rabbi Florence. He's going to take us and he's going to go through the beginning and then he's going to go into the idea of Um, he's gonna, he's gonna, oh, sorry, I'm just, he's gonna, he's gonna go through um, the first four ideas, and with that, um, I like to call Rabbi Florence to uh, enhance us with his awesome words, and his love, and his passion, and yeah, thank you so much. All right, everybody, happy Pesach! Okay, we are ready, um, so without any further ado, if you know the song, I know a lot of you are on mute, even though you're a mute, wherever you are, sing along with me. Let's take ourselves for a moment to Seder night, even though it's Sunday and we're a few days away, but together we could try to recreate that experience. So join me. Kadesh or Chatz, Karpas Yachatz, Magid Rachza, Motzi Maror korech shochan orech tafun barech alel nirza. All right. Now, I don't know if you got the message that this uh, virtual Zoom Seder was also BYOB. So if you have a beautiful cup in your house and a beautiful bottle of wine, or it's Pesach, you could eat, it's before Pesach, you could get away with some whiskey right now. Whatever you want to fill up with right now, make a lachaim. We're going to do the first cup. As is tradition, the opening of the Seder starts with Kiddush. Okay, just like every single Jewish event and Shabbos and, and a wedding and a Brit Milah, everything in Judaism, when we go up in levels of spirituality, of holiness, we pull out a cup of wine and we sanctify the day. So that whoever it is, wherever you're going to be, whether you're alone, or whoever's leading your Seder will start, of course, with the first cup of the fourth cup of the four cups. Uh, you make a Bore Peri Hagefen, and you can follow in your Haggadah for the, for the actual whole Kiddush blessing. I hope you have one at home. But anyway, you can drink with me right now. L'chaim to everyone. Wishing you all a beautiful Pesach. L'chaim. Well, sorry, sorry. When you're at your Passover Seder, you need one of these, okay? And you're going to take it, and you're going to lean like you're a king. And then you can make a lachan. That's a pillow. Now, following Kadesh, following Kiddush, we come up to the next step of the Passover Seder, and that is called Orchatz, where we wash our hands. Now, every year, of course, people ask, why do we wash our hands? But I think... Uh, in the COVID-19 era, I don't even think any of us have those questions. We're about to eat food and for hygiene and also, of course, from in the form of a spiritual preparation and a conscious act before we eat, um, before we're about to dip. The first of the two dippings, we pull out a cup and a basin like this. I hope everyone can see me. All right. Got a nice big basin and a cup filled with water. If you're at home with someone else, have them bring it to you because you're a king or a queen. And you wash your hands twice, two on the right, two on the left, and you do not make a blessing. All right. And that brings us to the third step of this Passover Seder. And that is our first act of dipping where we pull out what's called the karpas. Okay. The karpas is the step where we take a little vegetable. Now it could be, a, they say the word karpas, I was, my father always used to say that the Hebrew letters, the, ku, the kuf, the resh, the pe, and the samach stand for the traditional vegetables that people dip. The kuf is for a carrot, the resh is for a radish, the pe is for a potato, and the samach is for celery. And you would take the potato, got a little potato over here, a cooked potato, whatever the custom is in your house, and you take a little salt water. You saw my pre-Pesach video, it's just water and salt. You dip it in, okay? And you're gonna make a blessing on it, Ha'adama. Now, keep in mind when you do that, that later on down the road, you will be pulling out those bitter herbs, the maror. And the maror also is gonna be included in this blessing. So have it in mind. Now, why do we dip in salt water? Great question, Rabbi Khan because it tastes good. No, um, 
But uh, why do we dip in salt water? The salt water reminds us of the tears that our Jew, that our that our ancestors um, suffered, and not just our ancestors, all of Jewish history, of course, the whole Passover staters really starts off not with celebrating the exodus and the freedom as much as first we focus on the entirety of the slavery and the suffering that we've all been through and even today, right? So when you dip into that salt water, you don't have to think back 3,000 years. You could think today, unfortunately, all the Jewish blood and suffering that's going on right now, not just all across the world. But anyway, when we dip in, we have that in mind to make a blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Peri HaAdama. Now, cherish this little bite of vegetable because this is the last bit of food you're getting until matzah. All right? But you can't, don't eat too much. Now, following karpas, we come up to a lot of people's favorite part of the of the Seder, where we pull out the middle matzah. Now, if you have matzah in front of you, if you have matzah at your Seder, um, if you need, you can reach out to me or any of your local uh, Rehudi affiliates. Um, they hopefully could arrange some matzah for you. So you pull out your matzah, the middle one, okay, you have a stack of three, and you take it and you break it in half. Now, who could tell me which one is the bigger one? <laughs> but figure it out. I think this is the bigger one. I think, I think. Now, you take the bigger matzah and you wrap it up. I forgot my napkin, but you hide it. Of course, you don't want to, right? We're going to hide this one away. We hide this one away till later, till the end of the Seder. We have the afi koman. We're going to eat this for dessert. This is the traditional dessert eaten, um, of course, because we lack the Karban Pesach. Now, why do we hide the bigger one? A beautiful idea is brought down is that what ha the, the, the two matzot, the two matzot, the two halves of the matzot represent the Jewish people okay? and the brokenness of the Jewish people. And the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe says that, it's actually his birthday today, the Lubavitcher Rebbe says that, you know, the, the, the smaller half represents the Jewish people that are sitting at the Seder today. Right? Because unfortunately, there are millions of Jews in the world, but only a fraction right, or a small percentage of them are actually sitting by the Seder celebrating Jewish tradition of thousands of years. And we go through this journey together and slowly through the Passover Seder and our work and our input into this, hopefully it will create an awareness and a inspiration that it will lead to the day when the Jewish people, when we could find our other half, so to speak, our bigger half, the rest of the Jewish people, where we could reunite as one matzah, okay, as one nation, ultimately um, in Jerusalem this year, as we say, but this year, fine, so you put away the bigger half for later, for the, the smaller half will go later when you make the blessing on the mitzvah of matzah, okay. Sweet chomping. Now, following the yachatz, that is the fourth step of the thing, we come to the main event, and that is magid, that is the retelling, and that is the mitzvah of the night, and that is the point of the night. The entire point of the night of Passover and the entire point of the whole Seder is to give over the Jewish story. Jewish history is not something we read on Wikipedia, not something we read, <laughs> we learned about in school. It's something that's passed down parent to child, teacher to student for all generations, and that is what we're doing. We're sitting and giving over that story. And we open up that story, of course, as Jews, with the statement of ha lach ma'anya. This is, when we go back, when we point to the bread, and we say, this is the poor man's bread that our forefathers ate in Egypt. And of course, what do we do? And then we make the famous words, kol dichvin yesevi yifsach, kol dichvin yesevi, kol dichvin yesevi yechol, that whoever is hungry should come and eat. Now, of course, in all years, you know, it's a beautiful part of the Seder that we get to welcome guests and invite people into our home. Unfortunately, today, right? And the question, you know, the question then is, you know, usually we're saying this at the Seder, where it's too late to invite guests. If you didn't invite them till now, they're not coming. So who are you saying that message to? And I think all the more so this year, that question really rings loud is because you might be doing this alone. So who are you inviting? And the answer, of course, we're inviting ourselves. Come eat, but not just in a physical, physical sense, in a spiritual sense. Come nourish your soul.
fill yourself up in what it means to be a Jew, what it means to be free, what it means to be a Jew in this world today, even alone, right? And really focus on ourselves and invite ourselves to come partake and eat, not a physical meal, but a spiritual feast. Following that, we've come to the Manashtana. Now I begged my kids, <laughs> I begged them to stay up. Believe it or not, my kids are that young, right? That they actually go to sleep on time. But I begged them to stay up just to come say the Manashtana with me. Unfortunately, they're not here. They couldn't, they couldn't. <laughs> it's been a long day. They couldn't, they, couldn't make the, they couldn't make the distance. So I'm going to have to go this alone. But wherever you are today, we're going to sing the Manashtana. Now, before we sing it, just a little idea, because after this, I'm going to hand it off to the rest of the great Yehudi family to take the rest of the Seder. But the, the Manashtana is the opening of the Seder and the discussion. And of course, as Jews, right? Everything starts with a question. Everything starts with a question. We're always on that mo. We're always on that path of questioning and seeking and seeking and seeking. We don't just take in. We don't just want answers. We want to ask questions. Questions really open things up. And in fact, the, the sages teach that the word Adam, which means the human being, is equivalent to this word that we open the Manashtana with, and that is the word Ma, which means what or why. Okay, they're both numerically equivalent to number 45. The idea is that the human, being is, I, the human being is represented by the fact that he's a questioner and a seeker. That is what the human being is. He's always seeking the impossible, always seeking depths, never taking things at face value, always pushing and pushing. And of course, everyone here is connected with the Yehudi, especially you guys. Right, we're all on this journey of questioning. Question, question, question. That is who the person is. And of course, that is tradition. We open up with questions, okay? Now, of course, the standard questions we have, uh, we'll sing in a minute, but we, you know, this, it's really a moment. It's really a moment as, as a lot of the uh, Hasidic masters have done over the years. It's not just to sit and ask the four questions and then go to the answers. It's really to open up to yourself and ask deep questions, right? There's a lot of questions each of us, each one of us, have or may have today, right? Think about what's going on in the world. Think about what's going on in your life. Maybe people you know, friends, relatives that are suffering today, and God forbid, right? Lo Elena, which should not be on us, passing away from this world. So there's a lot of a lot of deep questions this year. You know, last year we sat down at the Seder in 2019, and it was kind of good, right? We didn't have many questions, <laughs> but I'm sure in the past few weeks, a lot of us, especially given the a uh, lot of time, you know, alone. Uh, to really think and ask questions. So a lot of those questions come out Seder night. We should ask them. You know, we may not come to the answers um, over Seder night, but at least we'll open that conversation with ourselves. And hopefully that will create a, a journey to a much, much deeper place within our lives and really have that, you know, start the beginning of that transformation that each and, each and every one of us could possibly attain on Seder night, that freedom. Now, wherever you are. Rabbi Slow. Rabbi oh, Slow. Wow. One of I your think children we have actually a... stayed up. <laughs> Look who stayed up. She wants to okay. you. <laughs> We're going to try to do it. Very, this is my daughter, Maria. If she wants, she can sing along with me. But wherever you are in your house, sing along with me. Anu ochlim chamei tu mata Halayla haze, halayla haze Kulo ho mata On all other nights We eat chamei te mata But on this night, on this night Only mata on all other nights we eat all different vegetables, but on this night, on this night, we eat more. On all other nights we don't dip, not even one time, not even one time, but on this night, on this night, we dip twice. On all other nights, on all other nights, we eat sitting or reclining. 
On all other nights, on all other nights, we eat sitting and reclining. But on this night, on this night, only reclining. Thank you very much. And we carry on. Thank you, Rabbi Florence. Awesomeness, the love and awesome. And um, so just to, just a quick, quick, just recap, Rabbi Florence, thank you so much. The idea of two half represents the Jewish people. With all you guys here tonight, we're going to bring everybody, everybody together once, w- once and for all, everybody together. And the idea of who we're inviting, uh, who we're inviting, inviting ourselves, and we're going to look into ourselves, we're going to focus on ourselves and make ourselves big, you know, dream big. And, and the idea of everything, you know, the idea of Yehudi, the name Yehudi, what does it mean? Is, everybody asks, what does Yehudi mean? Yehudi means, number one, a Jew. But Yehudi means about knowledge. Like Rabbi Flo said, it's all about asking questions. We, we, what Yehudi represents, all us rabbis, is n- there's nothing, nothing besides the, the idea of knowledge, about knowing. Ask the questions. We all are here for the questions. Ask, and all we want from any student, from anybody, is just to know more, just to learn more. So awesome. Thank you so much, Rabbi Florence. And... Um, we're going to go to our next legend, Rabbi. Rabbi Khan is about to take us through the next journey. He's up to, we're going to start with Avon Um We're going to go, and he's going to go on to the four sons. He's going to go on, on to the idea of the four sons. Hey, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Rabbi Khan. Looking forward to hearing your awesome, awesome words. I'm and I'm behind uh, the incredible Rabbi Flo. I don't have as much heart, but we'll, we'll do our best. Okay. So we're in the Passover now. We're talking about Avodim Ayinu. So Avodim Ayinu, how does that answer the question? So we're asking questions, as he points out. Tonight is focused on questions. The curious spirit. We're never supposed to be, we're never supposed to get old. We're supposed to continuously ask questions. My son, if I tell him a story, what, how, why? No, 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 no. Let me, uh, who, when, when did he say? Children ask questions. That youthful spirit, we should, we should grow old, uh, but never get old. So the, this is an important aspect about life. Always ask questions. The curious spirit is the Jewish one. Uh, we cherish the questions. Uh, my Rebbe always told me, he said, a good question never killed anyone, but a bad answer did. Keep asking questions. It's important to keep asking questions. Questions is the path that got us to the moon. We get us everywhere in life. So we're asking Avani Mayinu. So now we, we say, in this house somehow answer the questions. It says that we were slaves in Egypt. And, our, and the Almighty took us out with an outstretched arm, and he pulled us out of the people. He took us out. And if he wouldn't have taken us out, we would still be slaves. Would we still be slaves? Would we still be slaves? The, the message is clear. He wants each and every one of us. He knew. He knew we were coming. The omnipresent. He knows all. He wanted to take us out. He took us out. Me and you. He took us all out. Even if you are wise, it's interesting. In Judaism, we don't call anyone wise. If you know somebody, he's called the Talmud Chacham. Talmud means an analyzer of wisdom. We don't call him wise. He's still analyzing. He's a Talmud. He's still a student of wisdom. When, you, when you're continuously questioning, you're analyzing. So even if you're wise, with perspective and in our experience, you should discuss the verses of the Torah and still is our duty to talk about the Exodus of Egypt at length, as much as we can. The more we can discuss, the more praiseworthy it is. So Abadi Meinu, when you're a slave, you can't ask questions. The answer is, is that you're not, we were slaves. We're free now. You can ask questions. Why do we dip twice? Why is this night different? It answers the question, once we were slaves, now you're free. The reason you can ask Manishtana is because tonight is different. Okay, so we're-, we're Rabbi, Rabbi Khan, sorry to interrupt. We just, we missed the question before. Who wrote the Haggadah? That was one of the- The, the Haggadah, the, the Haggadah is, is a collection of, of, of two models of Shmuel and Rav. Um, but the actual text that we have, the actual text that we have is the collective consciousness of the Jewish people. There was, was not one particular author that wrote the Haggadah, which is very unique, uh, something that we should, the, the last thing that a Jew, unfortunately, gives up is the Passover Seder. It's the collective conscience of the Jew, and it's been transmitted since the beginning. Uh, but our, our Haggadah is a collection of the two models of Shmuel and Rab, but the actual text was actually as a community, as Kalal Yisrael, we came together and universally accepted, essentially, a text which is very unique. Uh, we had a universal acceptance on it. Uh, so there was not one author of, of, our, of our current uh, text of Haggadah. Uh, but um, the, the four sons were, were so, so it's actually not the four sons. So the Hebrew word banim means children. Uh, and unless the Torah modifies it to tell you that we're talking about boys, and it's banim, it's the four children. 
So we have four children, the wise, the wicked, the simple, uh, the Tom, integrity, and then the one who doesn't know how to ask. Four, so are there only four children? Are there no other kinds of, uh, anyone who has children knows there's a lot more than four different kinds. Uh, there's many, everyone is unique and has unique uh, questions and approaches and understandings. There's many more than just four. What does it mean? It means that uh, it's how we deal with the questions. What kind of answers? The Chacham, he needs a complex answer. He goes from complexity. He understands things with the moving parts and integration. And he goes from complexity towards simplicity. So you have to be aware that when you're speaking to a Chacham, and we might be Chachamim in some areas of our life, we might be wise in some areas of our life, we need that complexity. We need the understanding and we move from our complexity to simplicity. Um, let's go to the Tom. The Tom, Yaakov is called Ish Tom. That's not an insult. That's a man of integrity. He's straight. He's pure. The word Tom means purity. He wants a simplistic answer. We're here because the Almighty loves us. He took us out of Egypt. Enough said. That's why we're here. Because he took us out and he loves us. We have to understand when it has to be a simplistic answer. The Tom, he moves from simplicity to complexity his entire life. The Chacham, he moves from complexity to simplicity. The one who doesn't know how to ask, that's our job. Our job here is to make us have the curious spirit. That is the goal of Passover Seder. We have to keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. All of us don't, all of us are the ones who don't know how to ask. We forgot to ask. We think we grow old and we know a lot, so we stop asking. We just begun. We've been on, we're not just, we're scratching at the surface. We have to become questioning. So we poke ourselves and poke all of us around us to ask, ask as much as you can about everything in life. Why, who, what, how, questions are good. The Russia, the Russia is that uh, anyone who doesn't want to ask anymore, the one who doesn't want to learn anymore, he's left the ethical path. Uh, so as soon as we feel like we know it all, we got all the answers, uh-oh, he's left the ethical path. So I would say that uh, the Passover is all about asking questions. It's the gateway to freedom. And then we have to understand there's different answers for different people. Everyone has different approaches, but the four approaches to questions is those who don't care, so they don't ask. Uh, that's the Russia. The one who doesn't know how to ask, okay, he's lost his inquisitive spirit. We have to return that to ourselves. The wise one, he needs, he needs complex answers and he moves towards simplicity. And then there's the Tom, the superior one. He has simplicity. He understands a simple answer. He has to go towards complexity. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I was very impressed with this, uh, with this showing. Did a great job. Let's leave it to you, the MC. Back to the MC. Thank you so much, Rabbi Jacob. Once again, what the seed is all about is asking all the questions and you said it beautifully. So um, anybody seriously ask any questions tonight. You can ask any questions. There's many people which we're happy to answer, um, students and rabbis. Um, and so you can just put your hand up or you can write in the question. Um, we're going to go on to the next part, which we, um, we're going to go to, um, with Rabbi Abbasraw. Rabbi Abbasraw, a legend of legends um, in Orlando, I hope it's not too busy there now. Um, it's very, very exciting to, to have you with the words. We're gonna, he's going to carry on through the next part. He's going to go on to Dayan. Now, I just want to say just quickly before our also starts, that I just, it says, the first one, he says, had he brought us out of Egypt but not executed judgments against the Egyptians. So just the idea, it doesn't go on, I, I, don't, I hope I'm not intruding in Rabbi Arasul's words, just the idea of if God wouldn't have brought us out of Egypt, if he wouldn't have brought us here, that wouldn't have been enough. That we wouldn't have said Dainu to that. He has to take us out of Egypt. Why is that? Because the idea of, all, of coming out of Egypt and becoming, that's when we became one nation. That's when we became one people. So that's when we're all together and we keep coming together through our Zoom meetings, through our events, through our, our Yehud, through Yehudi as an organization, and through the whole Jewish people as, as the people. So I just want to say, I want, I want to just start off with that and I would like to invite Rabbi Arasol to lead us on the next part of the Seder. Thank you, Thank you so much, Rabbi Avinson. I'm just going to hand it off, if you don't mind, first to Rabbi Platzker because I'm still, I'm prepping. I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm enamored by, by the showing and everybody uh, and the beautiful tour that's being shared by, uh, by everyone here and, and the wonderful questions coming on Facebook and coming on Zoom. So I'm going to, I'm going to, Hand it to Rabbi Platzker. This is one thing about Yehudi, we have each other's backs. So I just need two more minutes to prep. Rabbi Platzker, if, Platzker, if you can uh, take it away. I would love to, what an honor, wow. So the truth is that as Jacob said, when he took over from Rabbi Flo, like, you know, 
was taken over by flow, that's no small big deal. So now not only do I have to take over by flow, I also take over by con and Rabbi Abizar put that in very nicely. Okay, so um, the next part of the Seder is so much more than just a, a random phrase or just like a song that people know it. It's really the identity of the Jewish people. And the identity of the Jewish people, another identity of the Jewish people is always in song. So I'm going to sing it, I think, instead of just saying it over. That's right with everyone. Bear with me. very, very famous words, but more famous is the ideology behind it. V'hisha amda laveseinu v'lanu. He who stood by us, our forefathers and us. Shalai echa bilvad amad alinu l'chaleseinu. Not one person in their history tried to reach up and destroy us. Ela shebechol davadar amdum alinu l'chaleseinu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Matzleinu Miyadim. The story of Jewish survival. We've had so many people, starting from Lava, the first person, going to Esau, through the Jews going down to Egypt, Pharaoh, through to the diff- all the different empires, the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, Hitler. It's, it's gone. The list goes on and on and on. And yet, you know what, as um, who wrote Huckleberry Finn, what was his name? Famous guy? Anybody? Mark Twain. Mark, Mark Twain, Twain, thank you very much. I saw a poem one time by Mark Twain, who was a tremendous anti-Semite. I saw a poem by him going into all the different nations that have been powerful, running the world, and yet every single one of them is gone. The Greeks, the Romans as a nation, they're gone. But the Jews are still here to this day, and him is an anti-Semite. He said, I don't understand it. They're, how in the world is this possible? And we have the answer right here. That our God, Hashem, our Father, who saved us, and he stood by us from every second of the way. And that's a theme that I'd like to hold on to as we go further on in the Haggadah. And the Haggadah goes on to discuss the backbreaking work and, and slavery that the Jews had to have. It started off, the Jews came down to Egypt, right, when they followed Joseph down. And eventually Joseph passed away and the Jews started be- becoming really st- big and powerful. And the Egyptians got very worried. They said, if we don't take care of this problem right now, as soon as there's any war, the Jews are just going to go onto their side. And so the Egyptians came up with a plan and they decided to entrap the Jews in slavery. And it started like, you know, innocently enough, but eventually it turned into slavery that only got worse and worse and worse, ranging to the point that the Jews even, to build the bricks, they had to make it from their own straw. And they had to go around collecting straw. And it was something that was impossible. And at this point, the Jews just turned to God and they cried out. They said, God, please save us. And as he's done so many times in our history, God comes back. And the, the next thing we're, we're going to be talking about is the 10 plagues. God answered to the Egyptians, right? And he, he takes care of the Egyptians in a, in a stunning way, something that leaves no room for doubt, no room for questions. And I'm about to show you it gets even more intense than that. But before we do that, we have a minhag, uh, custom, that we dip our finger in our glass of wine, and we take our, a drop of wine, and we put it on the table in front of us. And the question is, why is that? There are many answers to this. The one that so beautifully, again, sums up the ideology of the Jewish nation. Right now, we're about to go in and talk about the 10 plagues that absolutely destroyed and shattered the Egyptians to smithereens. And God said, look, I understand how bad they were to you. 
but we can't just sit there and just be so joyous because our enemies are being destroyed in such a destructive way. Let's take out a little bit of our wine, right? For each plague, let's take a little bit of our wine, our joy, and really try to imagine the suffering of the Egyptians, which is a mind-boggling idea because especially after all the Egyptians put, just put us through. Okay, so if you want to repeat after me, we're going to dip our finger in for each plague and put it on the plate. Dumb blood, Svardeya frogs, Kinim lice, arrive wild animals, Dever the killing of all the animals, Shrin boils, borrowed hailstones, Arbelocus, Choyshech darkness, Makas the Choyres, the killing of the firstborn. These are the ten plagues that Hashem gave to the naughty Mitzrayim. Okay, so as I just said, this idea of God being there from every step of the way is shown so strongly in this next idea. Because when the, right now we're sitting down to a virtual Seder. Seder means order. And that's really what this night represents, the idea that there's a Seder to everything. There's an order to everything that happens in the world. As a matter of fact, it's so strong in that regard that every single one of the 10 plagues that we have came as a specific measure for measure opposite some of the Egyptians did to us. In a certain way that the Egyptians inflicted us, they got inflicted back. And I'd like to go through them in a, as quickly, but I'd like to go into drop of detail. The plague of blood, okay, that means all water ranging from tears, sweat, anything turned to blood in the land of Egypt, except for the, what the Jews had. Now, this one's relatively easy because the Egyptians spent a lot of time, many years, spilling the Jews' blood. And therefore, like, you know, everything turns into blood to kind of show them. In addition, Pharaoh had a certain stink skin condition, and he used to kill 400 children every day and bathe in their blood. So here again, there was a strong showing of blood. In addition, again, the Nile River, which the Egyptians looked at as their god, as their sustenance, right? It, it, like, you know, it, it, irrigation to all their fields and everything, their field, their god turned to blood, which rendered absolutely useless. And not only that, all the fish inside would die and it smelled horrible. So their God turned into a real mess. So that was specifically why God chose the idea. Of, that's why God brought down the plague of blood. The next one is Sardai of frogs. Um, the Egyptians would keep the Jews up at all times and they would never let them sleep because they, you know, they needed this done, they needed that done, exactly as Rabbi Abinson has over there, a frog. Um, and so the frogs made a tremendous noise, hundreds and thousands of frogs going all over Egypt, everywhere, into their homes, into their food. And you know, once they would, it would jump into their food and there was no food in Egypt that didn't have frogs in it. And once the Egyptians would eat it, it would give them terrible stomach problems, just like they would feed the Jews horrible food. And the Jews and ended up getting stomach problems. So here was their payback over here. The next one, Kina, lice. They didn't let the Jews bathe, so, and therefore they got lice. Now over here, the Egyptians got the plague of lice, which pretty clear right there. In addition, they would make the Jews uh, shovel and sweep all the dirt in Egypt. And this, all the dirt and dust in Egypt turned into lice. So now there was no more dirt or dust for them to sweep. The next one, Arav, wild animals. They had wild animals coming from all, all corners of the world. And it, it was unbelievable. The polar bear, which needs to be in an in a Arctic habitat right next to a camel. And they absolutely just went crate ballistic, you know, bashing down the Egyptians' doors and obviously killing them. Um, and they made the, the reason that this was so specific was the Jews would, would be made to go chase wild animals for sport. The Egyptians said, go catch me a, like a, a, a wild, a wild tiger or something like that. And so therefore God said, all right, you want to play with my, my children? Here's a uh, wild animals right back at you. The next one, Dever, which was pestilence, all the animals that they had dying. So they used to make the Jews plow their fields in, with a yoke instead of an animal, instead of an ox or something like that. They would make the Jews do that plowing. And so now that the, their animals all died, it was very clear. This is what happens when you didn't make your animals do it. Now they're all going to die. In addition, um, they used, would make the Jews watch their animals, the shepherds and everything. So now that every, all the animals were dead, there was no more animals for them to watch. Boils. Um, they didn't let the Jews bathe. And or treat wounds, and 
therefore they got these tremendous horrible boils and blisters on their skin. In addition, they would make the Jews work out in the sun and they would get a lot of blisters from that. The next one, borrowed hailstones. This is something unbelievable. It was a ball of fire and ice that, as I'm sure you can imagine, created such destruction on its way down to the earth. It would like crash and, and destroy houses and then the flames would come out and burn everything up. So the idea that they would have the Jews working in freezing conditions in the desert and they you know in the same time boiling conditions and just like they would make them be working in boiling and freezing, so too they got hit with boiling and freezing. Also, the amount of noises that this would create, I'm sure you can imagine when you have a little hailstorm, imagine something a ball the size. So this would, they would, and it would freak them out. So too, just like the Egyptians used to make tremendous amounts of noise and really scare the Jews. Understand that we saw this was a very fitting punishment. The next one, Arba, which is locusts. It destroyed all the Egyptians' gardens and food and everything. And that they used to, the Egyptians used to make the Jews tend to their gardens and be like, watch all their gardens and, and, and make sure it was in pristine condition. Now there were no more gardens left for them to do. In addition, they didn't give them food and now all their food got destroyed. Darkness. They would lock the Jews up in dungeons in darkness. And in addition, they would make the Jews work throughout the night and when it was really dark outside. So God said, you're gonna mess with my kids. Here, you're gonna be stuck in darkness. And the last one, killing of the firstborns. This is probably the clearest. They wanted to just destroy the Jewish nation. God said, you wanna destroy my, Jew my nation, my kids? I'm gonna destroy and, and kill your kids. And you know, this idea that there was something so relevant, it's such a strong lesson to us that nothing in our life, as obscure and random as it seems, God's there watching every step of the way. And he's keeping score. And everything's going to come full circle at the end of the day. L'chaim. Thank you so much, Roy Plotzkart. I hope everybody's having a good time. And once again, any questions? I saw somebody's hand up, but I missed who it was. So if anybody, whoever's question that was, you're more than happy to ask the question now. Otherwise, we'll... Yes, Rabbi, I had a question. Go for it. I think the question posed, I don't mean to be too, uh, too paradoxical, but uh, why ask questions in the first place? Meaning? Meaning why ask questions? Why, why not <clears throat> follow the tenets of, you know, Judaism, I think, leaves room for a tremendous amount of... Um, a tremendous amount of understanding um, and interpretation. There's the word, <laughs> a tremendous amount of interpretation. And I think um, at what juncture, you know, do you first ask somebody to listen and then ask questions? I understand this is the holiday of asking questions, right? But um, in essence, you know, I'll get straight to the point. Where are we, where are we practicing humility? and surrender in this. Thank you. Beautiful question. Could, um, could I throw that on to Rabbi Alva? Can I take it? Oh, you could, okay, Rabbi Flo, go for it. So Daniel, what's up? I, I, and anyone else who could want to chime in after. Um, so Daniel, you're asking a good question. You know, why, why are we questioning? First listen and <laughs> be a little, you know, humble and then start asking questions. And you have such a good question that you nailed the entire order of the Seder on the head. Because in fact, the questions don't start at the beginning. We go through a good four or five steps before we get to the questions. Because one of the big questions is why don't we ask the questions before the Seder? Start explaining what we're about to do and then, meaning ask the questions, explain what we're gonna do and then do it and then proceed to start making Kiddush and washing our hands and doing everything. And like you said, on a certain level, before we start asking questions, we first got to get involved. You have to be in the game already. You're already with a certain level of humility. We just, we do the kiddush, we do the break the matzah, we dip the potato. And now once we're in and we humbled ourselves on that level, now we're ready to start asking questions. First we were students and now we start to ask. And anyone else who wants to get out also. Thank you so much, Robbie Flair. Awesome, awesome. 
So the idea is what well, so idea is when we when we when we're not supposed to wait till we're, we're not supposed to wait till we're like very old to ask questions. So as to as we're learning, as we're going on. Well, I think right. I think what Daniel's bothered by is like you know it's a little like uh, uh, like sometimes people walk in, they have no idea what's going on, and they just start throwing questions out. You know, questioning everything they see. And Daniel comes from a place of hey, you know, I should really humble myself first, watch what's happening, see a little, experience, learn, and then. I'm allowed to pose a question. I think that's really how the Seder awesome. set up with that, with that in mind. I think another thing that might help Daniel is that, uh, you know, Daniel, it's, it's, it's an important question. Why ask why, you know, let's uh, surrender and, and be humble. Um, I think that uh, the difference between Torah, Judaism, and many other religions out there is that we value our questions and that we want people to ask why. And we're a, we're a uh, religion based on uh, knowledge and inquisitiveness and thinking but just because you're asking a question doesn't mean that your performance and what you're going to do is based upon the answer of the question you see we ask questions because we want to understand and come closer so we can make the things that we do more meaningful but we're never questioning if we're going to do the things that we committed to we committed to following Hashem and following the Torah, and we're going to do that anyways. The questions are not, I'll only do this if you can answer. The questions are, I am surrendered to you. I am humble. I am connected to you, God. It would be so much more meaningful if I could understand my connection with you better. And that's actually why we ask the questions. That was actually part of the Garden of Eden, very deep question that you're getting to. But um, you can ask questions and still be committed to following God and living in a world that you don't always understand everything because you are surrounded and you are a humble person. Thank you, Rabbi Florence. And thank you, Rabbi Plotzka. Just a quick, I guess a quick recap of what Rabbi Plotzka, the idea of God is always with us. And just the fact that God noticed that everything that the Egyptians did to us and, that, and, and, and paid it back in that way. God could have done anything, but he paid it back because God is with us in every step of the way, in our troubles, in, in, in when we're doing well. So that's what Rabbi Plaska was giving us so beautifully. And we're going to go now to the one and only Rabbi Abisro to give us the next step of the most amazing story, the most amazing journey. Without further ado, Rabbi Abisro. Thank you so much, Rabbi Abinson. Thank you so much, all the rabbis and everybody that joined us tonight. It's a, a real honor and a pleasure to be here. I think that uh, the next step of the Seder that we're going to be uh, tackling is going to be the Dayenu. And I know we're all familiar with the song and we're going to get to the song, but I'm just going to introduce it with something that uh, I think something that we're all going through. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit uh, off the cuff of the, the, the moment experience that at least I'm having during the, uh, the isolation. And so uh, we open up in the Haggadah, how many good things did God do for us? And I think it's difficult. Um, it truly is difficult for us to really internalize good when it happens to us. And I think that there are times in life, and, and perhaps maybe the moment that we're all experiencing right now really going through this global pandemic, where we can truly understand that there are things that we have in life that we are not grateful for. And in the Haggadah, when we go through the experience and we're retelling the story like Rabbi Plotzker explained, and Rabbi Khan and how we're bringing up the questions and how Rabbi Abinson introduced that this is a night where we're connecting to our history, but not the history of our parents, but ourselves. This is our story. And the Haggadah takes a turn into this, this real storyline of true, pure gratitude, something that is intrinsic to the Jewish people. If you've ever heard Rabbi Albert talk about the meaning of Yehudi and Yehuda being thankful, but, but something true to the storyline of Passover. And so the Haggadah goes through 15 different dayenus, 15 different things that if God would have only done one of those things, it would have been a great story. It would have been compelling enough for us to be here on Passover night. If he would have just taken us out of Egypt, 
if he would have just brought us to the next stage, it would have been worth it. If he would have brought us through the desert, if he wouldn't have done the 10 plagues, if he would have. And so we're going to go through all 15 right now. And then we're going to see how can we internalize the messages behind these 15 and how can we take it to our own personal lives to become people that show pure gratitude. And so the first one is Hotsiyanu Mimitzrayim. Chevra, if you're out and you're about and you're living life, if you're alive, that's all you need to have. If you're not enslaved in Egypt, even if you're in isolation, you showed up tonight, you already have a reason to be thankful. You're here. It shows that somebody out there cares enough about you for you to be here. Number two, God took us out of Egypt. That would have been great. Just take us out. You didn't have to do anything to the Egyptians. You didn't have to show them how much you care about us. Just take us out of Egypt. But what is number two? Is that he said, no, you're my kinder, you're my kids. I can't have somebody push you around on the playground and not tell them, hey, you're messing with my children. And so God says, I'm going to take care of the Jewish people. I'm going to throw on the place. I'm going to show the world that I care about you like you're my children. And so the Jewish people, Seder night, we say, well, if you would have just done those two things, it would have been compelling enough for me to be sitting here right now, 3,500 years later. And then it says, well, if you didn't have to destroy the idols that the non-Jewish people, that the Egyptians are worshiping, we didn't have to see that. Our own Exodus story could have happened without that. God says, no, you're my children. I know that maybe you messed up a little bit along the lines when you were in, in Egypt. I want to tell you, not only am I getting rid of the people that pushed you on the playground, I'm getting rid of the people that told you that they were family also. I'm getting rid of the, the false ideologies that are getting you so corrupt and that are throwing you into depression and that are throwing you into despair. Our rabbis tell us that if the Jews wouldn't have left Egypt at that moment in time, we were at the worst level possible. We couldn't have, we couldn't have, Sorry, can everybody hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I thought you said you couldn't hear me. My apologies, Rabbi yeah. Albert. We would have been able to leave. We, we, would have been able, we wouldn't have been able to leave if, if it wouldn't have been that moment. And so it takes it a next step further. We're just going to go through this. And by the way, maybe it's worthwhile. Uh, maybe Rabbi Khan or Rabbi Albert can enlighten us. I think that there's an, a reason why there's these 15 steps. Uh, and our rabbis actually teach us an important lesson is that these 15 steps of gratitude are so crucial that they're the reason why in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, leading up from the beginning section of the Holy, the courtyard, into the Holy of Holies was 15 steps. King David, when he composed Psalms, he had these shira la ma'alot. He had these 15 Psalms that were these steps. And so there's these steps of gratitude. So we're here. He takes care of us. He wants us to feel like his children. Well, he also wants us to be in a relationship with him and nobody else. What does he do? He does it in a miraculous way. He doesn't just say, okay, leave. No, 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 no. My children. My children, when they walk out, the mic drops. There's an entire episode. There's a leaving. There's a 10 plagues. Again, showing endearment, showing caring, showing how much God cares for us. And so at the Seder, we would be completely wrong to walk through this entire night and, and just say, wow, look at all these miraculous things that happened to me and to my people. But not to be thankful, not to understand, none of those things had to happen. The only thing that needed to happen for us to be here tonight is for us to have been set free, period. No splitting of the sea, no 10 plagues, no 40 years in the desert. And so we continue moving forward. And so we're thankful that he split the Red Sea, but how does he split the Red Sea? God splits the Red Sea, but when the Jewish people walk through, they walk through on dry land. The journey that is a miracle that you're even able to take place in is actually a peaceful journey. You're walking on dry land. Miracle, fantastic. God showing his endearment, again, how much he cares. And so we have to be thankful all the way up to he takes us 40 years into the desert with giving us protection and care, leading us up into Israel. But he gives us the manna. Imagine this. 
you have something you can eat and it sustains you fully. It gives you life. It gives you everything you need to exist, right? It could have been we had to fight for our food. Every day we would walk out and God would send manna and we would have something to eat. It sounds so esoteric, it sounds so out there that it's hard for us to relate to, but just imagine in your own life, all the things that we have that keep us going, that we are not grateful for, that right now the entire world is actually experiencing. And then of course Shabbat, just can't wait for Shabbos. God gives the Jewish people Shabbos. You know what Shabbos means? It means he says, I want you to be able to contemplate without having to spend one moment working. You know, people are going through a crisis right now. I've read many, many articles, and, and you can ask anybody. I don't really read these articles too often, but I've been looking at the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and just all these things online, and I'm seeing all these publications. Work-life balance. How do you have a work-life balance when you live at home and you work from home? And all of a sudden, the entire world looks at a small group of people that say, what do you mean? On Friday night, there's Shabbat. I look back at everything I've done and I look to the future and I'm content in the present. How could that possibly be something that you don't live with? And so all these things that we have every day, taking us through Shabbat, if you would have brought us to Mount Sinai, you know what it is to go to Mount Sinai? Even if we didn't get the Torah, imagine this, we're saying, thank you God for bringing us to Mount Sinai. Even if we didn't get the Torah, we didn't get the Torah, who would we be? Just being able to be there at that moment in time and having that opportunity gives us enough of a deep connection to true knowledge that even, so to speak, if God didn't give us the Torah, it would have been enough. Taking us into the Holy Land, giving us the temple, and so on and so forth. But I really want to take this home, guys, and I'm going to just spend another couple of seconds on this. And it's important because we're all going through this together. And if we don't drive this home, we're going to miss the important part of this Seder night, which like Rabbi Abenson so beautifully said, this is the epicenter of Jewish people. This is the night that has never been forsaken. This is the story not of our people, but this is your story. Think about this for a moment. The world is suffering from COVID-19. The economy's crashed. People are unsure what they're going to be doing. But the Jewish people say, hey, I'm thankful for what I have. I am thankful for what I have. I want to tell you three stories, three short stories. I'm not going to mention the rabbi, but one of the rabbis on this team, on the Yehudi team, certain rabbi, you all know him, he's got a big smile. His father was not well. I'm not sure if it was because of this pandemic or it was for another reason. I'm not going to say his name unless he gives me permission. His father was unwell. Friday, his father comes home from the hospital. People are cheering. They're excited. They're thrilled. They're so happy that his father is back home. People outside, you can see the video, outside of their homes, keeping to social distancing, are cheering. Thank God they're so happy that this person is, is coming home, that his father's on his way home. Rabbi Florence gave me permission. It was his father, and it was because of COVID-19. But what does a Jewish mother, what does a Jewish wife say? I'm thankful my husband is home. He's alive and he's well and he's recovering. What does a Jewish mother and wife say? She says, thank you. She says, how can I show gratitude to God? I know how I can show gratitude to God. This year, Passover, for the first time in Jewish history, even through the Holocaust, at the very least, Jews were still together whether or not they were able to celebrate Passover, they were together. For the first time in Jewish history, Jews are apart. You can live three doors down from someone else, but you can't experience the holiday with them. My sister lives two blocks from my parents, my parents that are nearing 70 and they should live to 120 with health, and they can't celebrate Passover together. They have to keep it separately. You know what Rabbi Florence's mom says? Not only am I grateful for what I have, but I'm going to take it upon myself that there are widows, women that don't have the opportunity to celebrate the holiday because they've lost their husband, whether they have kids at home or they're all alone. And I'm going to take it on myself three days before Passover in a global pandemic where you can't get bare necessities to cook a Passover Seder meal for 80 widows in her neighborhood. Think about gratitude. 
Gratitude doesn't mean it's a feeling. It means it's action. It's got to be actionable. It's got to be something we do. Rabbi Florence's mother, Rebetzin Florence Sr., cooked or is cooking 80 meals for widows in, in, in the area they live in in New York. But that would be a, a story, a crazy story. Okay, that's a one-off, Rabbi. Don't tell me that that's something that everybody has to do. I want to tell you all this. Unbelievable. There's a friend of Yehudi. I'm going to say his name. His name is Isaac Castle, right? We're connected on LinkedIn. So I'm on LinkedIn this week, and everybody knows. I have two siblings. They're in the medical, um, medical goods business. They sell medical goods, so masks. We're talking about gloves. We're talking about all these things that the entire world is looking for. The price of a mask, I don't know if you've been seeing this, something that costs 30, 40 cents now is getting sold for 10, $15. And the global pandemic has made it into a place in time where people can't get, doctors, nurses can't get their hands on the medical necessities they need to save lives. Isaac Castle, a big friend of UD, he owns some sort of company, I'm not exactly so sure, but I saw he posted this on LinkedIn, so I'm sure it's, it's public. He finds in his warehouse boxes and boxes of, I think it's, I believe it's called N95, N95 face masks. These are the masks that doctors need that everybody's trying to get so they can go out to the grocery store. These are the masks that the entire world is looking for. He finds boxes and boxes and boxes and he writes in his LinkedIn post. He says the following, you should just know business is taking a big hit. Right now, the business I'm in is taking a hit. And I struck gold because I found the one thing that's not in my industry that happens to be in my warehouse for whatever reason that the entire world is looking for, a mask that's worth gold. And guess what happens? He says, well, I have to be thankful for what I have and what I've been given. And his company donates all these masks to a local hospital or to a nursing home or something of the like. The Jewish people are obsessed with the fact that being grateful doesn't just mean saying thank you. It means it has to be actionable and we have to do something about it. I'll leave you with the following story and the last story to close up and we'll send it to Rabbi Albert. Dayenu, Rabbi ladies and gentlemen, what does it mean to be truly thankful for what we have? And I'm speaking to myself as well. Something unbelievable. We see first responders, Hatzalah. Anybody who's familiar? In, in large Jewish Orthodox communities around the world, we have this thing called Hatzalah, literally means saving. This is the group of people that they're first aid responders. They have very fast response times because for the most part, they live in highly dense communities. And so if one out of every 30 people is a responder, the chances that they live close is high. And therefore, it's easy for them to react and respond quickly. I saw a post go out online and somebody was sending it to me, that there are a group of guys in Lakewood, New Jersey that have lost, this is, just think about this for a second, their entire livelihood due to the global pandemic and they're still taking calls day in and day out, volunteer to be first aid responders for people in their community that need to make it to a hospital, that need to get checked out, that may be in too dire of a situation that they can't even go into a hospital. These men and women are volunteering their own time when they have no livelihood left to make sure that they're taking care of people because they are saying, I am grateful. Ladies and gents, we're here tonight. We're with you, Dee. We're one family. We're talking about Passover. We're talking about the Yenu. Let's not forget. We have a huge opportunity before Passover. I'm going to throw out a suggestion and hand it off to Rabbi Albert. We're very far away from each other. And perhaps we don't have the cash flow to donate to help a widow, or perhaps we don't have the opportunity to give somebody matzah who wouldn't celebrate Passover. Pick up the phone and call up someone who's gonna spend Passover alone that should be with their family. And if you want a list at Hillel in, in, my, in UCF, Aaron Weil has a list of people in an old age home locally in Orlando that need a phone call because they're spending Passover in their room, isolated alone, and they're 80 and 90 years old, and they, they would love to just talk to a student. Pick up the phone and show that we're grateful for the friends and family we have, 
and we're grateful for the life experiences we have and we want to make it actionable and we want to share it with the world. Love you guys and pass it over. Thank you so much, Rabbi Evans, for absolutely beautiful. Just, I guess, gone and ruined. That was beautiful. That was amazing. That was wow. Um, just a few, just I guess the point of just recognizing every step, everything what God does in every step and then, re- and then actually making an action. Now, I just want to say, Robert Albert is one of our, our organization heads. Um, there's no better way to explain Robert Albert in the way of getting things done. We can dream, we can, you know, the organization here is together. Is only, is one of the, one of the big reasons is Robert Albert. Robert Albert, we have, we have nice dreams, we have big, you know, you know, we have passion, we have want, Robert Albert gets it done. So i just like to say thank you so much, Robert Abbasso and everybody still here um, on this journey, and I'd like to introduce Rabbi Albert um, the next the next part, and I guess we'll bring it to a close. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Rabbi Huda Abenson. By the way, I, I could listen to your British accent all night long. I tell you, you are mamish a hail gigid, but you know, really, we have to really thank all of the very special people that participated, uh, you know, so far this evening. You know, we had, uh, you know, if we don't have Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach, um, although we're missing something, we're not missing too much because we have Rabbi Yaakov Florence. And it's, he's mamish an amazing yid, and him and Rabbi Tzintzora, right? Oh, there it is. Amazing, amazing people. Uh, you know, they, they just bring so much. It's so special to have them. And, uh, you know, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, someone who's got the picture of the Chofetz Chaim, you know, as his Facebook thing, I think, you know. And uh, they say about the Chavetz Chaim that, you know, the thing is that he might have known that he was a, a humble person, but he didn't know that he was a Talmud Chacham, right? Rabbi Jacob Khan, in addition to being a humble person, is a tremendous Torah scholar. He has the answers to all of our questions, and he's the guy on the team that people go to and rely on. My, really an amazing thing, him and his rabbits and what they've done in Tallahassee, so we really love the Khan family. We really appreciate what they've done. Uh, we have uh, Rav Shlomo, Platzker, and Miriam. We got to spend Shabbos with them for the entire year in the Yehudi Hub. And they, they've become a family to us. Um, and they're so inspiring. And they have uh, such a devoted crowd who loves them so much. And, you know, basically, I think, comes to the home three times a week. You know, I think they eat dinner with their Talmudim three times a week. And I always wish I had a Rebbe. You know, Rebbe who could eat with me three times a week. Not that I'm missing eating, right? But, you know, Mamish, amazing, ama- amazing, amazing people. And uh, then we have, you know, th- th- I-, I didn't know who I was listening to. I just went into a trance, and I just focused on the beard for a little while. And I heard, you know, Mamish, an amazing, amazing Jew. There you-, <laughs> you-, you can hide the picture, but the beard is still alive and well in our minds. Uh, you know, and we have... Israel Abbasur and we have his wife Tamar. They're mamish, uh, amazing holies of the holies. They're builders. They're doing special things. You know, we're so zoyche to have them. And although uh, we may not hear from them this evening, we have Rabbi Mayer and Rabbi and Gemma Galab in, in, in Gainesville, and they are um, some of the tzaddikim in the world. Uh, how much they they care about other people and their talmidim the type of uh, parents they are to their special children, especially Mali, who's a special place in my heart. Um, we have a very, very special team and uh, very zoiched to be part of uh, this amazing group. Also just wanted to mention that we have Racheli, who's doing a great job as the, the MC of this little get together, this little mock seder. And, uh, you know, she may have left uh, to Israel as Adriana, but she came home as Racheli. And we, we are very, very happy to have our Racheli with us. And she's really unbelievable. And, um, of course, maybe some people that you don't get to see as much or hear from, you know, uh, really the guy that organized everything and organizes everything, right? If you ever ask a question, the only guy that knows the answer is this guy anyways. But a uh, round of applause to Shmuel Berkman, you know. I mean, he's the guy that, you know, he just gets it done, you know. That's the guy that's doing things. And uh, I think Israel Abbasur mentioned very nicely that Yehudi is really about having an eye in Toiva, a good eye, and Hakara Satov, and, and being grateful for things that are good in our lives. And there's really only two people in the world that could have opened Yehudi, that have that type of eye in Toiva, that type of good eye. And it's really Rabbi Shlomo Stillerman and Rebbe Tzinadina Stillerman, the founders of Yehudi, 
they have that type of ayin toiva, they have that, that good eye that really you can feel anytime you get involved with Yehudi, there's a good eye that's looking at you. And it's really the Stillman family. So just to kind of uh, bring things home a little bit here, right? So we have Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, right? So if you guys don't know what that is, no problem, right? Here we go. See? So you got Pesach, we got the little lamb trap over there, right? That guy. Matzah is dancing in the middle. And you got Maror, you know, you got that, that guy over there, right? So those are the things that are going on. Here's also another piece of Maror, right? So we want to try to understand a little bit about what this thing is and why is it closing off the Seder. So the, the Haggadah tells us that Pesach, what's the real story of Pesach? is that God decided to pass over the houses of the Jewish firstborns, right? When God, on the 10th plague, was going out to kill all of the Bechorei Mitzrayim, the firstborn of the Egyptians, the miracle is, is that God passed over our houses. But my Rebbe, my Rebbe's why he asks a question, and he says, oy vey, oy vey, oy vey. Uh, why is it such a miracle that he that, that they passed over our house? Like we were the victims, you know? <laughs> you know, we were the slaves, we were the ones that took everything from us and didn't pay us and worked us hard and backbreaking labor, right? And then all of the sudden the final plague is that all of the firstborns are gonna die, and now it's a miracle that ours didn't die as well. Of course it didn't die. These were the plagues against the Egyptians. <laughs> we're the Jews. Of course we're not going to die in the plague for the Egyptians, right? So what was the miracle over here? What's so special, right? Does it say that it was special that nothing bad happened to us before in the other nine plagues? So what exactly is so special that God passed over the Jewish people? That would be our first question of three. Next, we're going to have matzah. There, as you guys know, there's different types of matzah. There is the machine-made matzah, which is the squares. You can get that with the right kosher symbol, like an OU, or you can get the shmura matzah, which is watched even from earlier times, and it's in a big box like this, and it's really yummy, right? So I love it. Okay, so anyways, matzah zu shan oichlan al shuma. Why are we eating the matzah? Al shum shalo hispik betzei kama shel avosinu lahachmitz. Because you know what happened? I hope you feel bad for me when I tell you the story. On our way out of Egypt, where we were slaves for 240 years, and we were never sure when we're going to leave, on the day that we finally got to leave, can you imagine we didn't even have time for our bread to rise? We had to get out of there so fast that we couldn't even bring real loaves of bread. Don't you feel bad for me? What are you talking about? <laughs> Wouldn't we be happy that we're finally leaving? <laughs> like the day that you get to leave jail, the day that you get to leave the rule of the king, the, get, the day that you get to be freed from slave, from slavery, the thing that you're thinking about is that you didn't have enough time for your bread. Wouldn't you be thinking about that I'm finally free? <laughs> Interesting. And then the final question is that Maror Zu Sha'anu Oichlim Al Shuma. So why are we eating this Maror, like the bitter herbs? Because the Egyptians, they made our lives bitter. And one of the ways that they did this was that initially they used to provide us with all of the materials to build the bricks. And then uh, they told us, oh, you have more time. You want to pray. You're asking for extras. So you know what? We're not giving you any of the materials. You're going to have to figure it out yourselves. You're going to have to get the bricks yourselves. And this is actually when we started to really feel the pain and the suffering. This is when all of the pain happened. And I guess it's interesting, what exactly is the pain of Maror? So our questions are, number one, uh, when it comes to Pesach, why is it a miracle that our children were not included in the plague? Number two, Matzah, is that why shouldn't we focus on leaving instead of that we didn't have bread? And number three is that Maror, what exactly was the pain that the Egyptians caused us? So I think all of these things could be answered by a cute little story that was told to me a little while back. The story takes place on a bus in Israel. I've mentioned it to a few of you before, but it's just an enjoyable story. And the story goes that the bus was late for its stop 
and it was supposed to come to Yerushalayim and take people back to Tel Aviv, and it was one of the last stops of the evening, and the bus was running like an hour late, or whatever the story was, and double the people are piled up at the bus stop, and people, you know, these are Israelis, you know, they're angry, man. When they see the bus driver, they're jumping at the bus, you know, where are you so late? And then, uh, you know, they go up to the Nahag, and the Nahag says, where are you guys going? And they say, to Tel Aviv, that's where the stop. He says, I'm sorry, you know, look at the sign, the sign says Ramla. But they start to fetch and cry and say, please, Nahag, take us to Tel Aviv. The bus didn't come and we're missing and we're late. Help us out, please. And then Nahag says, you can't read anything? <laughs> he says, it says Ramla, and that's where we're going. And they, please do us a favor, please. You got to help us. We have no other way home. Finally, the Nahag says, you know something? He says, okay, for you, I'm going to do you a favor. So everybody gets on the bus, and they kiss his hand. We love you, we love you. And they bless him. You are the best, nicest, kindest person in the world. And they love this guy. And I'm telling you, it was like two busloads of people on one bus were talking, right? There's no room. No one has a chair. No one has anywhere to sit. There's no air conditioning. I mean, they're packed in like sardines, you know? And no one's complaining. They're smiling. Can you imagine? You know, it's amazing. He took, he's taking us out of his way. And they're smiling and they're laughing and they have the best bus ride all the way out to Tel Aviv. And every single person gets off the bus and they take his hand, they kiss him, they love you so the met Shimrak, bless you and watch you and take care of you. Finally, when the last woman's ready to get off and she wants to kiss his hand, then the says, Wait. Yeah. He says, I have to be honest. He says, The truth is that I was supposed to take you to Tel Aviv the whole time, but I was running an hour late. And I knew if I would come an hour late and try to take you to Tel Aviv, I knew you'd hate me and be so disappointed with me and yell at me and curse me and you'd be angry for the whole bus ride and you'd be complaining that the air conditioning was broken. So what I did is I changed the sign on the bus to say Ramla. And then when you came and you wanted to get on the bus and I told you sorry, then when I gave it in, so then you were happy and you were grateful and you loved me and kissed my hand. They said, I just had to tell you the truth. <laughs> it's an amazing story. True story. But, you know, the purpose of the story, my friends, is that um, we are also on a bus ride. And it's the bus ride of life. And we don't always get to choose the terms of the bus ride. So we can come in expecting a lot of things that didn't happen. And we can be miserable at the bus ride, at the bus driver. And we can hate the whole ride and we can complain, and we can be aware of all the problems. And that can be our life. And so many people choose to live that type of life. Unfortunately, the circumstances don't change. The problem was, it's just your perspective never did. Or you can choose to live a different life. You can choose to live a life where you're expecting great things, and you're happy with the things that you have. And you're grateful for the blessings that you have in your life. And you're not focused on what's missing or why you're not on the right time or why things aren't the way you thought they were supposed to be. But you're grateful and you're connecting to the blessings that you have and that you see in your life. And that's the type of life where you kiss the hand of the bus driver and you sit in a packed bus and you love every second of it and you're happy and you're enjoying. That is your choice in life. You can't choose your circumstances, but you can choose your attitude. You can choose your perspective. You can choose your mindsets. Why not this year when we're going through the Haggadah, we realize, Pesach al Shuma, you know something? We could have decided to be Egyptian and have an Egyptian identity, or we could chose to be proud to be a Jew. And even though being a Jew didn't mean all that much back then, we had to take the blood of the Egyptian God and put it on the doorpost. We had to choose, who are we? What is our perspective? What are we proud of? Do we want to be Egyptian? Do we want to have all the values? Or do we actually want to be proud to be a Jew? And thank God, those that came out of Egypt, they put the blood on the door because they said, a Jew I was born and a Jew I will die. You see, that's the type of perspective that it requires. And the next thing, when it comes to Pesach, then we have matzah. And matzah, you know, some people could have fetched the whole time. 
and said, Oi, can you imagine that we left this place and we had nothing with us and nothing on our back and nothing to show for it? Or you could be a Jew, where a Jew says, you know, thank God, we're finally leaving and we're finally headed towards our purpose, to receiving the Torah, to going back to our homeland, which is Israel. We finally have the chance to make the special nation and to serve God, which was our destiny. It's all in your mindset. And the final thing is maror, is that even in the maror, you know, it's amazing that they had to work hard before, but then all of a sudden, when they took away the ingredients and they made us build the bricks as well, for some people that was too much. <laughs> I used to at least have the, the, the ingredients. Now I don't even have that, what do I have? But a Jew is able to adapt to the circumstances. The Jew doesn't look at what we don't have. A Jew connects to what we do have. And then they were able to pray to God and open up their hearts until eventually God was going to take us out of the difficult life that we had in Mitzrayim. Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, right, are really an entire you know, idea of taking a new mindset, of looking at the things that we do have and realizing the blessings that we have in our lives. And today, of course, in the coronavirus, we're all distancing from one another and we realize we don't have our synagogues, we don't have our yeshivas, we don't have Yehudi gatherings, you know, in the presence. But the one thing that we do have is that we do have our heart and we do have our ability to have an open heart and a good mind and a good eye. And we could find the good in the people staying with us in our house, in our parents, in our brothers, in our roommates. We could make so much good in the places that we are. And clearly that's what God wants from us, is not to be sad about the things that we don't have, but to find the blessings, of course, in all of the things that we do have. The next part of the Haggadah, we're going to have a little music for this part. It tells us, the Dor Vador, in every generation, Chayavadam Liros Esatzmo, Kihilu Mitzrayim, you have to feel the freedom, like you left Egypt, that you were slaves, and that you left Egypt. And I think there's a song that kind of really helps us connect to the feel that we're trying to go for over here. Feeling of free. Sometimes I lay under the moon and I think God I'm breathing. And then I pray, don't take me soon, cause I ain't here for a reason. Sometimes in my tears I drown. Passover Seder is the time that we can free ourselves. Free ourselves from the mindset of focusing on the problems and the things that we don't have and the challenges. We can free ourselves to connect to the blessings in our lives. 
and to become free. And that is actually the freedom that God is talking about. Because every Jew who's ever lived in the world had challenges. But the point of being a Jew isn't for the challenges to go away. The point of being a Jew is for us to gain the mindset and the amuna and the belief that we no longer connect to the challenges, but we connect to the blessings that we have in our lives. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Rabbi Albert. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. And we'd like to, um, maybe Sral, you'd like to say something quickly? Sure. Um, first of all, before Rabbi Benson closes it off again, thank you guys so much for joining us on, the beha on behalf of the entire Yehudi uh, team. It's, it's a real, real honor and a pleasure. And uh, I'm humbled to be amongst such amazing rabbis. Um, just a quick shout out. Because um, we keep it rolling at Yehudi. We don't stop things uh, ever, really. Uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., Yehudi is participating in a global Passover trivia tournament. Um, their Olami is hosting with over 15 countries. They're expecting over 2,000 students. So if you're a young professional or if you're a student, you definitely want to get there. We're going to be sharing all the information. It's at 2 p.m. tomorrow, and there are huge cash prizes. Uh, the biggest team is going to make $1,000. The people with the most points are going to make $1,000. Um, I think the team with the most points is making 5K. So there's over $35,000 in cash prizes. Um, and it's going to be really an extraordinary experience with learning. Huge opportunity. Ishai Rebo, Yaakov Shweki. So a massive concert at the end. Connect with Jews from all over the world. So it's going to be really, really cool. What we're going to do right now, can anybody post it in the chat, the info? I'm going to see if I can do that right now um and then we're going to be sharing that with everybody so really hope that everybody will join us tomorrow again at 2 p.m make sure to register with your team so a little competition going on um it's every yehudi branch versus the other so obviously come and represent your yehudi branch and let's uh let's make this a reality let's see can i share a picture is that not possible anybody know if that's possible I'll post it. Not possible unless you share your screen. Okay. So. It's yeah. possible. Share your screen. Mm, uh, no, that, Rabbi, that's, can you, that's not the link. I'm going to send the link right now. This is the link for you guys to, uh, to register. Right there. There you go. So everybody take the opportunity uh, trivia.olami.org. Register now and then at 2 p.m. tomorrow, make sure to jump on and join your Yehudi branch, whether it's Tallahassee, Gainesville, Wynwood, Miami Beach, uh, FIU in North Miami Beach. Just make sure to jump on. Um, and yeah, we'd love to uh, show the world uh, what Yehudi is made out of. So thank you again so much. Thank you so much, Rabbi Avastro. And thank you once again, everybody for joining us. I think it was a beautiful. It was a beautiful, beautiful experience journey um, for ourselves, and we could hopefully take this to our family, to our home, the people we're spending it with. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to carry on. It's it's been it's been a good times, and wish everybody a good Passover, a time when we really you know look into ourselves and have have a positive experience um, and lots of love from the Hoodie family and from all the rabbis and from all everybody together and wishing everybody a good year. And we'll see you hopefully really, really soon, really soon, face to face, not just on the Zoom. Thank you and have a wonderful, wonderful evening.